Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I think we're uh, about. I'm very to... curious about Mighty's favorite superhero. <laughs> Mighty, what do you think? What, 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 so what would you say? What's your favorite superhero? No, that's really embarrassing, Alejandro. Wish you hadn't asked. I really, I, 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 I don't know. I have no idea. I'm just here for the fun of watching you guys and maybe ask me at the end and I might have a favorite superhero after we're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> okay, well, we shall... Uh, okay, uh, Izana, so you say uh, Hulk for his uh, strength strength and stability. Uh, well, emotional stability, possibly... Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that, but at least physical. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, I can see the resemblances, Anna. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary, Phil. Because <laughs> well, remember, remember that I am colorblind. So if, if you are completely green, I wouldn't know. So. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay well, uh, let's. Uh, get started today then so uh, thank you everyone for being here wonderful to uh, to have this uh, session thank you so much to uh, Alejandro for for being a part of this uh, this wonderful event so we're going to be talking a bit today about kind of different aspects of comics politics and society looking at kind of the evolution of them over time looking at kind of how these things kind of reflect each other in terms of comics as a reflection of reality or or reality as a reflection of of comics uh maybe so um sorry is anna were you gonna say something no no ah, okay sorry <laughs> well, i already said so, everything about hulk <laughs> okay wonderful well if, if, if there's anything else about hulk then just let <laughs> us know um so of course one of the reasons for this um this, this this webinar is because there's always um many different um things that come up kind of in the news or in our popular culture uh, many different things that we can see uh, talking about um, comics in very, di- very different ways through a lot of our uh, different uh, media channels. So, of course, you know, we've seen recently this, uh, for example, adaptation of, uh, of Watchmen, which has been this, you know, very, very interesting. We'll talk a bit, I think, today about kind of the subversion of a lot of the traditional superhero values in terms of Watchmen and kind of how that that represents a very different idea of what it means to be a, a, a superhero. Uh, of course, Black Panther as well kind of uh, was taken on by a lot of uh, particularly academics in the US talking about things like isolationism, uh, talking about things like imperialism. Um, going back to uh, what I mentioned about image, uh, Infidel, if you haven't uh, seen it, is a really, uh, really cool uh, kind of horror comic that has won a lot of awards recently this is uh, published by image and it's basically about this uh, muslim woman moving into a new york apartment where this uh, kind of supernatural power that feeds on hate uh, manages to kind of take control of a lot of the people a lot of the people around her who are really fueled by this idea of kind of anti-islam um hatred um, i'm sure a lot of you have seen this image here in the top right hand corner uh, in the last week or so. Uh, so there's been kind of this, uh, a lot of news about kind of, uh, oh my God, uh, Superman is, is, is now gay. Um, and uh, this has been kind of a, a big thing. Of course, we see lots of different things. Well, the, a very similar thing in many ways, kind of when um, Miles Morales, for example, was kind of announced as the, uh, the uh, African-American uh, or Latino uh, Spider-Man. Uh, we can see kind of, how this this kind of debate in the media and then of course you may have seen as well kind of in the us recently a lot of debate about uh, the punisher for example um and how he's been used in, by a lot of people uh generally people who have not read the, <laughs> the, the punisher books uh, but people who've decided to take this image of frank castle and decided that he's this great representation of far-right politics here um so I don't know if uh, Alejandro, you have any kind of uh, particular thoughts here looking at kind of developments, how these things have been appearing in recent media. I mean, first of all, we have to take into account that comic books, as any other art media, are going to reflect um, a part of society where they come from or a moment in history when they come from. Right. So sometimes it's hard to look back at certain comic books 
with uh, different views. And as always, we, we, we now have also have to take into account that there are big fandoms, right? People are very fans of the comic book, so they don't want change because there's nothing more conservative than a fan. So for instance, this new comic book that, uh, the, that Superman's a son is now bisexual or LGBTQ. I, I, I don't know exactly, but I, 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 I got an email from one of my, from my students, like really outraged that why is this happening? I mean, well, it's a reflection of the times and something that I always uh, take into account when I'm, and I read and analyze comics like we're doing today or tonight already is that, uh, so even if the author didn't have like something uh, thought out, just wanted to tell a story, that story also is going to reflect certain values or certain ideas from the time and the, and the place where it's being written, even if it's criticizing some of the values of the society where that comic book comes from. But also we have to remember that, a, that the comic book is a two-way art. It's not only the writers and, uh, and, the, and the artists and all these guys. For instance, for me, now that we have here Watchmen, it's a great example because Alan Moore wanted to deconstruct the superhero, wanted to show that superheroes were kind of sick. But what the fans really like were the sick superheroes, like uh, the comedian and Rorschach. And then we had oh, a lot of these the, really the, violent. The, 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 fandom, the, the fandom we've seen kind of so many people, you know, describing Rorschach as the, the original incel. Uh, it's been, uh, yeah, really interesting to see kind of how people just identify with him and say, well, this is the guy I love. <laughs> exactly. And I mean, Rorschach was originally not an insult, but asexual. But then you can see how they're reading, depending on the time. I mean, we talking about Rorschach as an insult when this was a comic book written in 1986 or published in 1986, where the word insult didn't even exist because there wasn't even an internet or, or, or a, uh, a public internet. It was still something very limited. So um, that's one of the interesting things, yes? how certain fandoms react, how certain interpretations don't depend necessarily on the author, but also uh, in the, on the readers of the comic books as well. So that's all the whole stuff that we have to check out. It's not a one-way um, issue, it's a two-way or even three-way issue between all the interpretation, interpretation sorry, and all the stuff that we can find in, in, on a comic book. Even something as basic as Charlie Brown or Little Lulu have a social commentary or something to reflect about the values and ideas that were happening when those comic strips were written. Excellent. Well, we'll be certainly be uh, looking at uh, a number of these aspects uh, this evening. Uh, one mm -hmm. thing I want to, uh, to quickly mention as well uh, before we, we get started really uh, is um, one of the reasons as well for uh, wanting to do this is also to let everyone know about um, my new uh, elective, which will be here from uh, from next semester. So if you're thinking about an elective uh, next semester, if you're interested in comics, video games, um, many other aspects of uh, geek culture, then please join up. It'd be wonderful to uh, to have you there as part of the elective. I think it's going to be a be a lot of fun. So. Uh, let's uh, get started here. So um, uh, I imagine here, Alejandro, we're, uh, we're not exactly starting with uh, the most up-to-date of uh, publications. No, well, as, as, as well, I, I've seen, I, there's one of my students here, of my current students. Oh, hello, Camila. Uh, <laughs> so maybe she can help us out with this. But there's something that I, I really, as I say, I, I, I really like to take a what we call in political science, a uh, historical and sociological focus in my research and in investigation. Try to understand exactly that moment in time, that place in history where comic books are born in this case, right? Something that I find very interesting about comic books is that the first comic books come from, uh, from New York City, yes? New York City is a really interesting place if you take it into account, not only in history, but also in geopolitics, that it's also one of my fields of, of, of research, because New York is, the, is nature's best defended island, the island of Manhattan. It ha, it's, a, it's a natural uh, harbor and it's a natural stronghold for that harbor, yes? And the first Europeans that got there were not the British, as some people assume, it was the Dutch. 
And that's why New York still today reflects the values of the Dutch of the 17th century. The Dutch were the traders, were the guys of free ideas, of free movement, but also were the biggest uh, slave, um, how to say that, the, big, the biggest slavers as well, yes. So it's funny because right from the start when it was called New Amsterdam, it was this melting pot of different people always in, in, in going into commerce. The, I mean, some people claim that Muslims don't belong in North America, they're wrong. The first Muslims were in New Amsterdam and were a, a bunch of Moroccan uh, tradesmen. I mean, you could find everyone. And still today, New York has that idea of the melting pot. And remember that until the 20th century, New York was like the place where all the immigrants came into the United States. Yes, so it had that thing. So we have to take into account that this variety of people, this melting pot of people, because it's, uh, I mean, even back in the day, only 2% of the settlers were originally Dutch, even though it was a Dutch settlement because of all the people, all the strange people. So also most of the arts, that's why do you find that most Bohemians and most crazy people live in New York still today. Yes. And there were like another forms of art to entertain the masses, the immigrant working class masses. Right. So one of that, what well, that's one of the things that has that that, that 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 makes New York like a very special place for that. And something that it comes from um, before the comic books, you, you could say that it's bef the, the father of comic books are what you can see at the. Um, yes, this side of your screens, yes, in the left side of your screens, that is the pulp fictions. If you know Tarantino, that's the name of the movie. Yes, the pulp fictions were like serialized little books that were made from pulp paper, that is like the cheapest paper. And they had like this torrid adventures or romance or, or even horror uh, in that in those. And those were like serialized productions. I mean, one famous character from these pulp fictions was El Zorro, yes, or the Scarlet Pimpernel. So it was the first like influence. And most of the people who wrote in these books were from Jewish origins. Yes, and because of their, their Jewish ancestry, they couldn't make it to the big top of the writers. There's a lot of racism, yes, because New York was, it's all about tolerance, but not acceptance. And remember, this is like the traders, yes? It's as long as you can put money, you're okay. You see, that's like the, all the, all the mental, the American, the time is money and business are business mentality of America. That's exactly, that's actually New York's. <laughs> so that's a lot, had a lot to do with that. Yes, and a way to keep, keep people entertained as well was in the newspapers, they found out that a way to sell newspapers was to use little cartoons, little comic strips that told us little stories that people could relate to those stories, right? So it was the merging between the comic strips from uh, these newspapers that were written for the working classes, for the immigrant classes. It was not for the high classes because they considered lowbrow, yes, like, something like, and it's a distinction that comes from Europe that there's highbrow art and lowbrow art. So it's something that transpired also into this continent and also New York that had to do with that. And if you, if we could move to the next slide, Phil, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, so you can see some of the examples of the first comics, comic strips that appeared in, the New, in New York's newspapers. This is the Yellow Kid up Yes, and he was, uh, it was called like that because of, of, you can see the dress of this kid. And also, uh, you, it, it, it was from an Irish neighborhood. You see like the Irish, even in the UK, Phil can attest to that, were kind of the lower classes, like everywhere they went. <laughs> and this is from someone whose second last name is also Irish. <laughs> so, and, and one of the things that stood out from these comic books was not only that of these comic strips, sorry, is that they were not only really entertaining, is that they used a language that was common to the working classes. Yes, that's why I like the example that you can see below. Yes, this can't be happening. Not after all the years I have successfully dodged it, you see? So there's a, you could say that up, there's a populist origin to comic books because they were usually showed like the values of the working immigrant immigrant classes in New York. They talk like them with all their faulty errors. So of course there was a big scandal because they say, oh, not only are they are not learning English, they are learning it in a wrong way. And kids, and this is, you know, as always, there is always a group in all societies 
that always damage the phone, and these are the concerned parents and mothers. So, 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 whether, so whether whether this is you know reggaeton or whether it's horror movies or whether it's Dungeons and Dragons, exactly. Or There's it's always a group else. of parents complaining. <laughs> There's some <laughs> moral panic. Yeah. So and and I mean. All my students know that there is, if there's a group in society that I dislike, it's parents because of this. They always ruin the fun. So they had to do with that. So one of the, uh, I don't remember the name exactly of one of these uh, Pulp Fiction books. Yes, one of the editors, uh, I don't remember the publisher, found out that compiling, yes, every month, the best comic strips from the newspapers was a way of business. You know, the New York way of thinking. Everything can be sold, right? So that's how we have we get the first comic book. It's a compendium of the best comic strips, yes? And then most of these artists and most of these writers moved from the newspapers and the pulp fictions to the comic books as such. So that's the way that you have the comic book. If you, of course, it's not possible uh, doing it physically, but you can do it virtually. If you read the first Batman, for instance, you can find that it's a lot of assortment of a lot of things. There are comic strips, there are the Batman stories, and there's also short novels, yes, or short uh, chapters of novels, because most of those writers wanted to ascend to highbrow culture. Yes, writing comic books or pulp fictions just was only a step on the ladder to higher culture, but most of them, even though if, uh, they stayed there, even if they like it or not. So that's how we have the origin of um, of the first comic books in New York as a populist form of art. Right. Right? Actually, just just to mention that I've always found it just uh, a very interesting thing how in the U.S. Um, this this the, the term of comic book um, with this uh, desire to add you know more prestige, more kind of highbrow thing because in the U.K. we just say comics. Uh, yeah. Whereas in the U.S., this the the, the, the creation oh, has, of this phrase comic most, book, book, but it has mostly to do Phil with the to, mm -hmm. to, to distinguish comic strip, the one that you see in the hmm. funnies, the newspaper, sure, from the sure. comic book that compiles or that used to compile the best of those funnies or those stories in the newspapers. Then they got a life of their own. It has to do a little bit more with that. Oh, Could okay. we move, please, for yep. uh, with for for the next slide? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's why from the early 20th century up until the 1950s, uh, we can uh, have something called like the golden age of comic books. Yes, because comic books originally were not only about superheroes. You had all kinds of subjects. Yes, you had romance, you have adventures, you have all, even medical dramas, a la Grey's Anatomy, stuff like that, yes? mostly for kids, but yes, there was a big, even, and remember this, this was a time of the two world wars. So we had a lot of patriotic and army and, and war comic books, yes. But ones that stood out in the early, in the late forties, in the early fifties, one of my favorites, and this is like the starting point when Phil was asking your favorite comic book, <laughs> there was this comic industry what that was called EC Comics. Don't confuse it with DC, this is EC Comics. And part of the thing that I like about them is that they had like these comic books about crime, but they didn't move to horror. And that's when we have the Bolt of Horror or Tales from the Crypt that still live on that legacy, you see. And I like them very much because, well, nowadays they seem, may seem corny or not as scary as back in the day, but this was punk before punk. This was death metal before death metal. The big moral panic was because comic books by the 1940s were already accepted as part of American culture, yes? Part of the reason that comic books got an expansion in the rest of the world is because American soldiers that went to Europe or went to Japan during the wars took comic books with them and then gave it away to little kids. And that, that's why you have manga and that's why you have European comics as well. That's part of the reason. But these managed to raise a blister in American society. That's why I call them punk before punk, because now again, again, we have concerned parents, uh, Christian leaders making comic book burnings, because even though in these comic books, uh, evil doesn't win, always the good guys always win and stuff, but they were very lurid, as you can see, very violent, very graphic. Yes, because most comic books were, in, were poorly drawn, actually, 
most of the artists just do it like quick away or something. But these were really detailed and really specific in their violence. So this raised from the parents a lot of a, 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 there was a lot of um, a, a lot of um, yes outrage. That's a word I was looking for from the parents. And part of that is because something that Amer American parents couldn't explain in the late 40s and the early 50s is why do we have juvenile delinquency? I mean, we won the war, we're prosperous, we have money now, but I mean, as a former uh, juvenile delinquent, it's because it's fun, yes? And most of the comic books that were found in juvenile delinquents were uh, the EC comic books, you know? And that's why you can look, and I always ask my students to that, look at, uh, at the death metal bands and look at horror movies. You can see that still today they borrow a lot you can see like the first seed, and I do consider that the first form of extreme art was the easy comics, Tales from the Crypt and Vault of Horror. That was made, what that was, it was because of this that comic books went to trial and went to, this, to the stands. And most of the, of the comic book publishers bailed out. Only easy comics stood out, but the, I don't remember the name of the guy. I'm terrible with names. The, 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 the president, and the, the, the son of the founder of EC Comics stood trial, but he was so maxed out in Coca-Cola and amphetamines and speed, yes, that he was like really frantic during the jury. So he couldn't, he wasn't able to make a good defense of comic books because it happened just like with pornography. So they asked, is it okay to show a beheading as you can see in the left of your screens? And he said, yes, it's tasteful, it's artistically. So the jury, so th th this was this was part of the hearings for the uh, the Haynes Code. Yeah, that all the Haynes Code had to do with films in the 1930s. Okay. I'm going to go further with this in the in the in the what happened with comic books because they almost died. But by this was 1953. But by 1954, we already had rock and roll music, so parents had a new thing to be concerned about. <laughs> okay, so as you can see, there's always, as Phil said, a new moral panic. There's always from reggaeton to rock and roll to punk to death metal to horror comics. There's something that is going to scare the parents away. Yeah, so that's why. I mean, it's very interesting. One thing I noticed here, of course, talking about kind of you know these being shocking horrible comics is is um ray bradbury uh being mentioned here who of course you know now most people recognize from fahrenheit 451 uh, mm -hmm. as, as one of our most uh, prestigious science fiction writers uh, from history but as obviously here he's being associated with this uh horror comic and obviously if he's writing this sort of this sort of story then he must be a a, a terrible uh, merchant of blood and uh, and terror no, and I mean, science fiction was also a, so, something about concern. And most of those writers had to start somewhere. You know? So <laughs> some of them started writing for comic books. You see, Ray Bradbury was becoming like established name. But yes, that's one of the interesting things. So if we can move to the next slide. Mm -hmm. But of course, something that it's intrinsic to comic books, because I mean, you have horror comics, but there are horror movies, yes. Uh, you have crime comic books, but there's crime movies as well, yes. But the first character that was born into comic books and that make comic books popular is the superhero, right? Here we're going to take two of the most popular and the most historical ones that are Superman and Batman. But we have to take into account that they were not the only superheroes. There were all kinds of superheroes. And one of the big questions, why do they use their underwear outside? Yeah, why do they use their undies, right? And it's because the wrestlers from that time dressed like that in order to reinforce certain male anatomy in order to, uh, how do you say, to imply testosterone, right? And masculinity. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have these first superheroes that were capes and stuff that were inspired by circus strong men and wrestlers as well, you know? And that's why, and that's what, that's why we associate so much comic books with superheroes because the superheroes was born. There were no superheroes movies before this or books or whatever. Yes, Batman was inspired by El Zorro and Scarlet Pimpernel. Of course there were influences, but you can tell there, there is something very American about the superhero. Because if you have ever gone to the United States, come visit us, have you noticed that everything is huge? It's big in America, even the people I mean, my God, right? And so, and everything, I mean, something that I, that, that I love about 
American culture, and that's, that's my culture by my mother's side, it has to do with that everything is mediatic, you know? Uh, I mean, you go to uh, sporting events and you can get anything about the teams and all the stuff, and even there's a mascot and rah, everything is like uh, hyper. Yes, so that's why they're not, they're not, they're not interested in heroes. They're interested in superheroes. It has to be something out of place. And the interesting and the and the and the, con and the sociological contrast you can do between um, Superman and Batman that is so interesting that I find so interesting is that you find two ideals of the American society just just like there because in the case of Superman who is Superman Superman is an immigrant. He came from the planet Krypton, and he's the immigrant that's trying to fit in. He wants to be a part of us. He wants to be human. He wants to have a normal life, but he has certain faculties that make him stand above, yes? And it's not a coincidence that he landed in the Midwest, where I come from, <laughs> because <laughs> what, what most of the American stereotype, the middle American comes from the Midwest, you know, that He's polite, that yes, he's all, he also always stands for truth and all that stuff. And he's the oh, shucks, yeah, very, very, from kind, very kind to his mom and dad. Exactly. No, and I mean, you can tell I, I was there, I, I, I was there recently. People are very polite and kind, and you can even talk to strangers and make a conversation. Yeah. And they have like this ah oh, shucks mentality. So Contrary to the idea of Superman that we have today, that, that was built actually in the 1950s of Superman as the American hero, Superman was most of a populist hero. He's one of us, even though he's an immigrant. Yes, because he's the aw shucks boy from Kansas. Yes, he's this simpleton, this good scout that only wants to fight for truth. Some even claim that the original Superman was almost, almost socialist because of it, because he fought for the common man. He was one of us. He's a populist leader. And you also have to take into account that by the time he was created in 1938, the president was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, even though he was not one of us, he was a patrician, a Yankee patrician. Uh, um, most of his policies and most of his popularity was because he was a very populist president. Populism not only happens in Latin America, here you have before Trump, an example of American populism. You, the New Deal and all, all these ideas of of the whole community, yes. But on the other hand, you have Batman, yes? Superman fights during the day in Metropolis. Batman during the night in Gotham, yes? Some people say that, you can, that, that it's possible to argue that Metropolis is New York during the day while Gotham is New York during the night. Again, New York, yes? And who is Batman? Batman is this rich millionaire guy that fights, yes, against crime and injustice. And as you can see, there is something very American of taking things into your own hands. Yes, we have this myth that we are adventurous. We, if, if it doesn't work out, we'll make it work out, right? Some even say that Batman's really dark side, he's almost like a paramilitary, right? Police doesn't work, so I'll take. And you see that it's something that resonates a, a, a lot in, in American society. The guy that makes law onto his hands. Now that you were talking about the Punisher, before the Punisher, we had Batman, right? Yeah, yeah I mean. So Batman, although the original Batman used to fight alongside the police, there was a still cer certain respect for the institutionality of the stuff. Batman is a good reflection, not of the populist side of American society, but of the individualistic New Yorker side of American society, that I can make things by my own. You, you see, that's why the clashes between Batman and Superman, but not in the movie, were, are so interesting because you have one hero that is the hero of the masses, of the common people, and one guy that is individualistic, things have to go a certain way, right? You can even say that Batman is the Machiavellian prince because he's privileged, he's, man, he's mandated to protect the lower classes. Yes, that is his, his, his duty. And that's something that I see, that you could see also, it's uh, uh, something that lingers uh, also from British society that is supposed that the high classes are there, that the Lords, yes, that they can run, they can't run, yes, to the bomb shelters when the Germans were bombing, they had to stood and give face, right? Well, I don't know. Oh. <laughs> Phil can tell you a little bit more about <laughs> the, British society. The, 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 last, the last one to leave the sinking boat. Exactly. So that's why they had also like in the Titanic, although in the United States, there, there, there is no nobility 
constitutionally speaking, because they were fighting against the, uh, the British crown, you could see that there's still lingers, that idea, yes? That high-class people like Bruce Wayne should be there. And just like the prince, he protects the city, he protects Gotham. Whether the menace comes from, the threat comes from outside, inside, from the institutionality, he's there to protect Gothamites, right? Even in the recent movies, you could see that even most of the enterprises that maintain uh, Gotham's economy are Wayne enterprises. So it's, it, it, there's that duality about that, that, that uh, American self-made guy that has to take things into her hands, contrasted to Superman, the guy from the common folk, the common hero from the American masses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so I wanted to, uh, to just kind of make a little uh, mention here um, of uh, this uh, really, really wonderful novel. If you get the chance to, uh, to read this, uh, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay by Michael Chabon. This uh, won the Pulitzer, I think, in 2001. Uh, but uh, really, really interesting. It's well, a, a fictionalized uh, account of kind of the creation of these early superheroes. But if you're interested, particularly in this period, uh, it's a really, really interesting book. So basically, um, Cavalier and Clay are these uh, Jewish immigrants who uh, basically decide, well, they, 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 they are looking for kind of inspiration and looking for some way to make money. And they get this idea, this inspiration for um, creating these superheroes, or particularly, uh, as you can see here, this uh, main hero, the, the escapist. Um, so this kind of becomes this wonderful uh, metaphor in the book, this great kind of double meaning of the escapist, which we see so often uh, in the, when we look at comics. Uh, in terms of the escapist, in terms of the, his actual very uh, literal uh, escapism, like uh, Harry Houdini uh, being able to kind of escape and, you know, uh, having this superhero ability to, to get away from these uh, problematic situations, uh, just like many people um, wish to do uh, during the times of the Second World War and during these times of, you know, massive international uh, turmoil. Um, but at the same time, this second meaning of the, the escapist, where, of course, you know, he, he's also this representative of our uh, desire to escape uh, and go on this kind of fantastic uh, flight of, of fancy uh, through superheroes, which kind of is this great way that, that, that uh, comics in many ways are able to allow us to both simultaneously escape from reality and both engage with, with reality in, in new ways as we're reading them. Um, so this is kind of seems contradictory in a way, but it's a really interesting facet of, of how these comics actually work. And of course, uh, I wanted to include here this, this image, for example, you can see kind of how a lot of, as, as Alejandro mentioned, of the early comics, partly as well, of course, as a way to show, no, you know, comics, they're not bad. They're not anti-American. They are fighting with America. They're on America's side. You know, super, Superman, he's an immigrant, but he's the great American hero. Uh, and so, of course, we have this horrific uh, uh, racist stereotype of uh, the, uh, the Japanese here, of course, uh, as Superman is kind of uh, taking up against both the Hitler and the, the Japanese forces, uh, which still, I mean, of course, now we can see as well in recent decades where we've seen kind of, you know, the fight against terrorism, uh, the fight against uh, many, many different, you know, international conflicts happening around the world. And that superheroes still, again, have, have had this real appeal at this time where they, on the one hand, enable, enable us to uh, engage with um how we're able to fight uh, with these things and how we're able to have a representative who um, is able to kind of fight on our side. But at the same time, it's something that lets us kind of escape from the kind of daily reality uh, of all these things that, uh, that surround us. So we'll continue onwards then. So uh, talking again about the, uh, the comics code. Yeah. So this is like the comics version of the Hays Code that is like a self-censorship that the, 
surviving uh, comic publishers did, especially DC Comics, right? There was, uh, in 1954, this book that was part of the trial that is The Seduction of the Innocent. I always point out that it's a good example for social studies uh, students or people that work in the social sciences, like me, is like, you have to beware of false correlations. And this book is a great deal. This book was the ones that, that, that was the one that claimed that Batman and, and Robin had a gay relationship, that most comic books induced the consumption of drugs because Popeye, Popeye eating his spinach, that was marijuana, that was a, a, like, a, <laughs> like a, an allegory for that, and uh, the, all the bondage it, it, with Wonder it doesn't, Woman and stuff. It, spinach doesn't uh, usually make people strong uh, quite in the same way uh, that uh, marijuana, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if they're a little confused on the effects of that particular substance. Yeah. No, clearly he didn't try <laughs> any part in his life. So because of that, we have the comic books code that's sanitizing comics, you know, like a self-censorship. And that's why we have like the gung ho, really sani uh, like really sane and really, even you could say uh, naive comic books. This is the time that Superman becomes really patriotic. And it's funny because it, it, it goes like in a self-contradiction because Batman trying to prove that he was not gay, he became a camp character. And as we know, camp is something that it's uh, associated with gay culture. So it's funny. And one of the interesting things about the Silver Age of comic books is that we have the time of the golden, what, what we could call the golden age of the United States of America, the post-war years, the 1950s and 60s. A lot of money, a lot of prosperity, the American housewife, all that ideal about the, the best American. But these comic books proved that there was a lot of neuroses in the American society. So that's why you had a Superman that was all too powerful, but nonetheless had to fight with getting fat or with a smoking addiction. And you have a Batman that is insecure of his own sexuality, right? So that's one of the, the, one of the pointers. And even though today that we live in a cynic age, some people, fans of the, of the Silver Age comic book say, but it's good to have an ideal. It's good to pop something to, point to, I don't know, to strive, yes, to be better. Yes, that's something that, um, that, 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 that's like a really specific um, uh, characteristic of the Silver Age. Could we move on please to the next slide? Ah, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. There we are. Okay. <laughs> ah, there you go. Something that I find really interesting as an international relations major, yes, yeah, and a political scientist at that, is that also remember that this is the like the peak of the Cold War. Yes. So there was a really an effort from the, the Department of Defense and from the United Armed Services, United States Armed Services, to push kids not into the military, but into science, because we have to remember that the Cold War was also a competition regarding science and technology. Yes, the space race and all that stuff. So that's why now we have superheroes that resemble astronauts, that not, they, not, they don't resemble um, wrestlers anymore. They resemble astronauts. So we have the Silver Age Flash. You see that he has like a jumpsuit, no cape, no on this outside, really airtight, right? And not only that, uh, and, and if you remove his mask, he's, uh, he has a crew cut, you know, like the, 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 the hairdo that most military personnel still today use. So that's part of the reason. But also in order to, to try to convince kids to, to push kids into science, as you can see, most of the superheroes and the villains from the Silver Age not only resemble astronauts and all the things about the space race, but they also reflect on scientific concepts. I remember reading one, a, a reissue of the original Flash comics from the Silver Age, and they explained how Flash, using like basic physics, how Flash could like run over water, or how, how could he run through a wall without breaking it, because it's the, at certain speeds, da, 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 and there was the, like the, a whole panel dedicated. It, it, to... It's all about the vibration of particles, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> so that was a way, and, and how did Flash get his superpowers? Because of a scientific uh, mishap, aligning in a batch of chemistry. That's why one of the popular gifts in the 1950s was a chemistry set for kids. Nowadays, it's too nerdy, 
too geeky to, to give a kid. But that was a popular one because you have to get kids into science. Also, the Silver Age Green Lantern. He has to do a lot of with, with the space race and also Aquaman, the exploration of the seas. So that's why you see it's pretty interesting. And who were the enemies of the Flash? The Mirror Master, Mr. Freeze, all had to do with scientific concepts. So that's why something that's interesting and that is worth pointing out about the Silver Age of comic books is that relationship between the Cold War comic books and the space race and the need to have more scientists and more people into science starting from a young age. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. But the Silver Age, it's also very interesting because it's the birth of Marvel Comics. I know I have a lot of Marvel Comics. We were just asking people, like, but yay, Team Marvel all the way. And that had to do because uh, Marvel Comics tried to think of a new way of doing comic books. Stanley was going to quit writing comic books because he wanted to be a writer, a, a, a book writer, a literally writer, whatever. So uh, it said that behind every every great man, there's a women ventriloquist. It was Stanley wife who said, if you're going to quit, why don't you write the comic book as you would like to write it? You're going to leave that industry, write it. Don't care about the comic code. Don't care about that stuff. Go ahead. So he wrote the first number of the Fantastic Four. And people loved it because it broke with all the naivete, with all the cleanliness of DC Comics. Here you have superheroes that find among themselves that they behave like a normal family, that they have discussions, yes, and they argue. And also there, there is, here's something that is, has been known as the marble way because it was a collaboration between the writer and the artist. What usually what happened is that the writer used to write a script and the artist had to work around that script. So that's why you see most of the comic books in the Golden and Silver Age are kind of rigid. They're not very dynamic. They're not very flexible. But Marvel Comics, because they wrote at the same time, yes, like the writer used to give an outline. The, the artist was free to draw whatever he liked using that outline. So, so, there, the writer, so there was a lot more fluidity, a lot more flexibility. Yes, in as the you process. can see in this run by um sorry yeah so there was a lot more fluidity in the process yes no what's happening here with my okay. audio <laughs> setting <laughs> i'm sorry yes so as you can see comics were more fluid the artists had them and uh, and that was also uh, enticing about Marvel Comics. They were more fluid, were more real, if you like, because there were more struggles. But as you can see, in, during the Silver Age, uh, Marvel comic books also adhered to the idea of science. Who were the Fantastic Four? Four astronauts, they got their powers from cosmic rays. Where did Hulk, we had a Hulk fan here, where did he get his power from? From gamma rays, and he was a scientist as well. So you can see Alan, that's another thing, Flash, and all the heroes I mentioned from DC Comics were also scientists in their secret identities. So you can see that there was this push to, to, say, to say to kids, hey, scientists are cool people. So, but Marvel broke a little bit of the naivete and that's why we have Marvel Comics. So one big difference we have between DC and Marvel is because DC are gods trying to live as humans. But in Marvel, you have humans trying to be gods. So that's why you have the more how do you say, like more tragic heroes, you know? Mm. Spider-Man doesn't know how to handle his private life with his public life as Spider-Man. He's always worried about, um, about Mary Jane and his Aunt May and all that stuff. So more, most people could relate to a superhero that was a little bit more humanized, that had troubles, that had, that had to pay rent, that had to do all the normal stuff that we have to do today. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. And with... Um, I forgot to take those, uh, to, to, to take that, the, 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 it's in Spanish, but okay. okay. <laughs> With the Marble Age, we, we get introduced in what is the Bronze Age of comic books, okay? And why is it the Bronze Age? Because nowadays comics become a little bit more adult because now it's not just for kids. Most of the people who grew up reading comic books were now into college and wanted to keep reading comic books. And you have to remember there's something really particular about 1973. I don't know what happened that year, but everything broke down, finally. 
you had the oil crisis, you had Pinochet in Chile, you had um, uh, also the post-industrialization. That's when they surrendered in Vietnam, then the American troops, you had Watergate and Nixon. So there was a lot of mistrust in the institutions. That's why you had movies like Dirty Harry, where mm. the Punisher is inspired from, by the way. So that's why also that the 70s is remembered by Americans, even more by American conservatives as the decade of decadence, because it was the me decade. You no know, people, all the flower power, all the big ideals from the 60s and all these American splendor from the 1950s were gone. Yes, that's why there, I there was a, 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 a lot of uh, cynicism uh, exactly. in the 70s. I think that was a, so a, a very- hero that we're used to has its splendor in the 1970s. I mean, it's no coincidence that it was during the 1970s that you got punk, heavy metal, and industrial music. I mean, <laughs> and, and I mean, for people here in South America that are used to living, but you have to understand this, it was a huge blow to the American society because they were winning since World War II. But now they showed that they were not so perfect, that Vietnam kicked their asses, all that stuff. So you have a more introspective. In the Bronze Age, you have the introspective, uh, character. So that's why you see they have all the heroes questioning themselves. You have Green Lantern and Green Arrow, these two heroes going all through the United States of America in a green band, of course. Yes. And regarding social issues, not, not uh, different from the Silver Age, they were not fighting aliens. They were not fighting super villains. They were going town to town to every town in America and looking at the issues of America from two sides, the conservative that is Green Lantern and the liberal that is Green Arrow. Yes, the X-Men that you all love, that it's a, like a big soap opera, those are from the 70s with the Dark Phoenix saga. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, they were tackling issues that were that were prohibited by the comic code, drug addiction, alcoholism. Remember that also the 1970s uh, was the time of the, in that time it was not LGBT, it was the homosexual fight for rights in certain countries, in the UK, for instance, it was still illegal to be a homosexual. Oh, absolutely. So, so you had all this fight about the identity, all the identity stuff we have now. And, and also in the 70s, it was the me decade. So stupid crap like self-esteem or self-realization, those are inventions from the 1970s. And something that you also have from the Bronze Age is that you have the return of the independent comic and the comic book store, because before the 1970s, you bought comic books at the newsstand, at the news agent. Now you have specialized comic books because it, it became a cult thing because of that introspective, even remember 1976, the bicentennial of the independence of the United States of America, the special issue has Captain America alongside Falcon, and remember that Falcon is a black guy questioning what is the real America? What has happened with our black society? So if there's a lot of questioning and you can reflect that on the comic books in the 1970s. The Joker that you know that's a killer and stuff, well, he also made his appearance in 1973, coincidentally, the same month that the oil crisis happened. So I don't wow. know, it's, 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 it's very interesting because of that. <laughs> Next slide. Next slide, please, yes. Okay. Okay, and here we come to my favorite age of comic books, the <laughs> Iron Age, also known as the Dark Age of comic books. Because if there was a certain despair, a certain cynicism in the 1970s, you have to take into account that for the 1980s, it was the ages of excess. Yes, everything was hyper in the 1980s and even more in the late 1980s. And for me, it's a very interesting, interesting, sorry, um, period in pop in pop culture history because I don't know what happened between 1986 and 1994, but people were pissed off. <laughs> I mean, there was an economical crisis in 1987, but it's funny because by 1986, the Cold War started to thaw. Yes, and soon we had the downfall of communism and the Soviet Union, so there was no motive. Yes, but in the, if the 1970s questioned the superhero, the 1980s destroyed the concept of the superhero. Phil already showed you Watchmen. That was one of the first deconstructions. There was also the Return of the Dark Knight by Frank Miller. That's another one that questions how feasible superheroes are. But here's one of my favorite comic books. You were asking about my favorite superheroes. Well. One of my favorite one is martial law. Martial law doesn't deconstruct the superhero. It takes us to the darkest alley, beats him up, rapes him, and leaves him for dead. I mean, it's a really violent comic book that you think invincible, 
trashes the whole idea of superhero. Mm -mm. Martial law does a lot. And you have to, that's why I always tell that these are, this is the period I grew up. So I can relate a lot without a lot of that stuff. I don't know, but we were so angry because now we don't have heavy metal. We have death metal. Hmm. Now video games have also turned really violent, like with Mortal Kombat. Even during the 1990s in pop culture, the, even in the more mainstream sites, you had grunge that was very depressive, you know, and all this stuff with Kurt Cobain and stuff. And I mean, something very 90s. I don't know if you have seen this movie. Seven with Brad Pitt and yes, dark as hell with industrial music as I mean, you, 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 do, you, look that, you look at that, you watch that movie and you're not a happy person after that movie. So that is reflected in comic books. And one of the independent that started in the dark age was image comics. So this is also like the golden age for image comic. And most of the critics, because they tend to side with the silver age, say that these are the cocaine comics. You know, there's a lot of energy, a lot of hyperblast, but no content. And look at the movies as well. And for me, that's fine. Because one of the positive sides of that, not only is because I do love, right, and everybody knows that violent music and violent movies, I, I love violent pop culture. Yes. And, uh, and, 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 and this age really satisfied that, had to do, but that's really an, an experimentation of form. Now you see comics that don't have like the gutters, yes, or uh, superheroes that went beyond the gutters and stuff, all that stuff that started in Dark Age. It was the experimentation to make comics even more dynamic. Even they look out of proportion and there's a lot of criticism and a lot of flack. You know, uh, this guy Rob Liefeld got a lot of flack that, oh, he draws horribly. But I remember in the 1990s, Rob Liefeld was the shit. Everybody wanted to do something with Rob Liefeld. I still defend him. I know his- Just, just his don't, don't, don't expect him to draw feet. Exactly, or proportion. But in his defense, I got to say, he was always trying to look dynamic as if the characters were going to jump out. That's why the feet yeah. were also very small and, uh, and all this testosterone stuff. And I mean, look at the movies at the time, Commando by Schwarzenegger and all these really hyper masculine sure. yes so some people used to think back in the day that comics became adult no this is the teenage years of comics. Hmm. yes i'm trying to be an adult but i don't know how and yes and also because most of the comics were targeted to guys like me suburban white kids that really are bored with everything also remember that during the 1980s was the riddle and scare although I was here in Bogota, so I didn't have to do, but I do have ADHD. So you could say that these are the ADHD comics. And one of the symptoms of ADHD is that it's a low, to low tolerance to boredom and frustration. So these comic books are hyper in every sense because you can be there's bored. There's no, no quiet violence, moment no to, to fall asleep. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I, I mean, that's, that, that's, reflects, that's reflected. I mean, these are the comic books. And I, one of the critics, of this age, I, I found it so funny because he said, these are the kids that were fed up with industrial music and heavy metal music. And these were the kind of punks that were not like this, um, you know, like the avant-garde punks from the 1970s that had like this conceptual sneer. No, these are the Ramones kind of punks. One, two, three, four, gaba, gaba, pa, 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 yes. <laughs> or discharge of one of these, that, that's a punk I like. So <laughs> that's why I, I get very emotional every time I talk about the dark age of comic books. But you have to take into account that it was also a dark age because of all these hyperkinetics. Yes, these were the times that you could, that, that people found out that they were comic collectors. So most of the comic books opted to form and not to content. So that's why you have like plastified and metalized covers with a hologram because every co comic became was trying to become a collection object. But what, yeah. what happens when everybody's doing the same? There was even a financial bubble in comics and comic books almost disappeared at the early nineties because of that. Because most people were buying buying because they were going to become collectors, but with there's much of a thing, bah. I'm sure that, I mean, the, the, the market was just completely saturated and uh, exactly. possible, you know, there just were not enough people to buy so many uh, so many comics. No, and I mean, I always tell my students when I teach this class that I was one of the guys that got stifled, stifled in the, in the because I, I was visiting my, my grandparents in the United States. And oh, yes, there's this package of five X-Men comic books for $10. OK, they were the exact same comic book. The only difference, they had a different cover. Oh, I felt so robbed. So and of course, I mean, all this high adrenaline, it's too hard to maintain. People want to get back to comics with content, with certain stuff. So that's why 
also you could tell that the dark age of comics went to an end and it's still today uh, badly remembered but what i'm i'm one of the defenders of the dark age of comic books <laughs> <laughs> next and slide please slide and yes you can see in the dark age of comic books you had a lot of crazy stuff we killed the ideal we killed superman that even showed in the Colombian news, it was crazy. <laughs> you had Image Comics, Spawn. Spawn because he was a spawn of the devil. Now you have the 19th anti-hero, a guy that's so traumatized. And in the long run, you don't know if he's really the hero because he's so violent, he's so aggressive, he behaves like a villain, but somehow he's the hero. Yes. And also, as you can see here, I use the, the, the sample of Rob Leefield's uh, art. You know, he was the creator of Deadpool, of Cable, of all these really violent, uh, uh, and I say, I, I wanted to show like that kinetic side. Next slide, please. <laughs> so Alex Ross. Yes, and this brings us to an end because with King Kong Come in 1996, you could say it's the end of the dark age when Alex Ross says, no, we have to get back to the ideals. King Kong Come is an excellent comic book because you have the silver age superheroes, a little age, as you can see, Superman has whitening hair and fighting against the 90s heroes. And the 90s heroes said, oh, we're so traumatized, we can't even function. So it's a deconstruction of the deconstruction. Yeah, sometimes it's good to have an ideal to have. And that's why from 1996 until today, there hasn't been like a, a more periodization. It's said to be the modern age of comic books where you have the four ages uh, cohabitating at the same time. Yes, and right, you can see that there's a, that, 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 that all of them had their faults, yes, but all of them had their high ups and things to learn from, like the golden age, there's a lot of variety. In the silver age, it's good to have an ideal and to have something to fight. In the bronze age, it's good to question yourself. And in the dark age, it's good to have some now and then certain action and to work in form in the, part, in the aesthetic part. So you can see we have a compilation of the four ages in the modern age today. Because <laughs> it's a, a, a very, uh, jarring contrast really between the dark ages really where you have kind of so much action and so many things happening and kind of so much kind of you know hyper kind of you know, this kind of MTV influenced kind of cut shot all the time and then kind of going to say Alex Ross's style here which has such a kind of serenity about it such a kind of tranquility everything just seems like this kind of beautifully kind of uh, captured moment of, mm -hmm. uh, of time almost in this kind of, you know, very kind of, you know, sort of almost like a kind of neoclassical kind of style that, uh, that, that the Ross is famous for. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, you can really see kind of how, how, how it was you know, a real contrast um, from what had come before. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, yes. So it was like, let's ease up. And you can, as you, as you know, well, the comic code died in 2011. So now we don't have a comic code. Now there's like this ratings, just like in the movies. And of course you have to remember, we live in the internet age that started in the 1990s where you can have everything at the same time. So that's why you can see it in the music, in movies that, I mean, nowadays nostalgia is like the main factor around everything because we have an architecture that doesn't die. That is the cyber, that it's cyberspace, right? You want to find, I don't know, uh, a strange UK punk bands from the early 80s, you can find them. If you want to find a comic books, a dark age style, you can find them. Yes, sometimes you have to pay, but it's there, it's available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's not gone. Yes, so that's why it's difficult to talk about a new age of comic books because now comic books reflect that. You could argue, for instance, Civil War, that was a commentary on the Patriotic Act by Bush. And also you could say that thanks to 9-11, yes, we need an ideal again, someone to protect us. You can see Americans were acting like orphans after 9-11 that happened in New York again. <laughs> so we're mostly in New York, there's the Pentagon. And, um, and that's why you can see the rise, even though the first modern uh, comic book movie was X-Men in 2000, like uh, a year before the 9-11 attacks. But you can see all the rise and, in the, and, and that need for someone to protect us even from ourselves. But and now I, I was looking at some commentary. I don't know if you have seen WandaVision and the new series that now we have the millennial superheroes that are frustrated because they were fighting for good, but I mean, they still have to pay their mortgage, their student loans and all like the millennial uh, drama that's going on that they, were, they, did, they didn't get the world that they were promised by previous generations. You know, so now the comic, now comic books are reflecting 
that kind of angst that we're living today. Sure, no, which again kind of is an interesting way of kind of going back full circle to kind of the 1950s sense of dissatisfaction of all the people who kind of fought in the Second World War and then came home and said, well, I was promised a new world. Where is it? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but I mean, that didn't happen much. In, in, that was mostly in the European countries. Now Americans are living that angst that happened in European countries after World War II, because remember, uh, something positive for Americans after World War II is most of them got university degrees and they and there were jobs waiting for them in the United mm, States after sure. the war. So that's why the 1950s is like this age. And they, that's why, as I said before, why do we have juvenile delinquents? Because it's fun. You see? And so... Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> People have uh, expendable income for the first time. And well, exactly. what are we going to do with it? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> So, um, and as you mentioned, kind of, it's it's quite difficult to sort of think about kind of new directions. Then, but I um, mean, we can always see kind of different ways that uh, uh, different comics are trying to sort of push in different directions. So, different things, obviously, in terms of um, representation, of course, has been a big thing. And as as, as we mentioned, you know, about um, like the ongoing uh, conflict, you know, with the with the, the far right. Uh, for mm -hmm. example, we can see that, you know, just as, as an interesting contrast there, kind of with this image of Superman fighting against uh, fascist regimes here, kind of uh, the uh, Superman smashes the Klan comics as a uh, sort of attack on these uh, alt-right, far-right groups uh, within the United States. Um, but uh, this is definitely kind of one of the things, one of the reasons why I'm a big fan of, of, of Image, for example, because I think kind of one of the things that Image has done a lot recently, um, and I think they've been doing it for a long time, but particularly for, for the moment to try and break out of this kind of, you know, third position uh, in the hierarchy and to try and uh, do something different, do something that will really kind of create their own uh, their own brand is to really kind of play around a lot with a lot of the kind of uh, framework of uh, traditional comics and really try out a lot of things which at times kind of are quite uh, shocking in terms of, well, the sort of content that certainly wouldn't have been approved back in the days of the, uh, the comics code, uh, but things that uh, as comics much more now kind of have this um, kind of adult uh, readership and uh, people like ourselves are able to kind of pick up all these different things that are appearing, uh, you know, through our our apps or on our Kindles or whatever else. Even you know, here in Bogota, where it's not so easy to get hold of the the physical comics themselves, perhaps, but uh, mm -hmm. we can certainly get hold of whatever is is being published and keep up with all these different uh, worldwide trends. Exactly. Yes. So. I mean, now the com comic books are very varied. That's why I, I also, we address like the history and some American history, but we can look for instance, all the different cultural uh, stuff. For instance, superheroes never caught on or didn't, caught very, didn't catch very much in the UK because they prefer like suave heroes like James Bond. And there is the whole post-imperial uh, angst in the UK that you can, reading stuff like ah, I forgot the name but something like Kamala 3000 or in uh, Judge Dredd even has that kind of post uh, also the French comic books that work around with stereotypes and surrealism and existentialism or here in Latin America that comic books reflect like that Catholic uh, idea that if you're poor and you're miserable you're going to do great yes and we have the like the quixotic anti-hero like the Chapulin or someone that it's not handsome, that's actually ugly, that's dumb, that's weak, but somehow manages to do and has like this uh, Hispanic humor, right? Like all this picaresque humor that, uh, that, it's, uh, that, that still abounds in all Hispanic cultures. You can find them in stuff like Condorito or... No, you know, no, I mean, I, I mean, I think kind of obviously looking at the UK, of course, from my own experience of growing up in the 1980s, of course, uh, I still think kind of that uh, V for Vendetta is uh, oh, just what, what, what one of the the, the 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 main kind of the wonderful um, ways of just showing this kind of reality uh, mm -hmm. that many of us live through uh, during that time in in comic book form. It's interesting how many people have sort of said to me how they really don't like the art so much of V for Vendetta uh, because it's kind of so sort of.
Ray and and has kind of got this really kind of you know uh it doesn't have, you know, the brightness that we expect from a lot of our comics. And um, whereas for me, really, it captures perfectly. And it's kind of one of these ways that um, comics, um, unlike any other art form, really, is, are able to capture the, the, the essence of the time, uh, the time of Thatcherism, um, when kind of these things were just kind of uh, bled to a kind of grey uh, consistency within society. And uh, very much, I think it, 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 it's a really good example of something that kind of captures politics and society at that time. You know, um, and I mean, even Alan Moore, one of his poems about having a movie about V4 Vendetta, he said, I was reading about British politics specifically, that there was something worse than Thatcherism, that Thatcherism could lead us to something worse. So that's why he didn't want to be V4 Vendetta, like a liberal idea that became in the 2000s, like this anti-Bush thing. No, he said, this is something really British and should be read as something really uh, British. But okay, the, uh, as I said, <laughs> it's not only the author, it's the fandom that also takes their own interpretations of the stuff. So yes, I mean, you can you can do that kind of, of, of idea. Or also we haven't mentioned Japanese manga and all, all the Gosh, cultural man. side of Japan <laughs> that you can, you, you can find in there. Uh, recently, I, I see some of my students, we were talking about Japan in comic books. Uh, like two weeks ago, yes? And the whole thing about aesthetics, no? Because everybody in manga is pretty, but not the villains. And also the mecha manga like uh, Macross and all the stuff I grew up in the 80s, like Robotech and all that stuff, yes, that had to do with Japan becoming uh, an, a technological powerhouse in the 1970s and 1980s. And then you have the deconstruction of that in Evangelion and the whole the depression after the Japanese bubble that still today lingers. So uh, you can find all those kinds of relations in those in, 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 in any manifestation that you like in comic books. Mm -hmm. A wonderful now Definitely there's a, a lot that we're able to, uh, to talk about, but I think for, for today, um, we will uh, finish talking for the moment. Um, I don't know if anyone uh, here in the, the audience has any particular comments or uh, questions, uh, anything you wanted to, uh, to say or ask. No, well, uh, thank you everyone for being here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Izana. Uh, for that comment. Oh, uh, so uh, Paola. Okay, so uh, what do you think about this, Alejandro? Um, the deconstruction uh, of a hero makes up a new perspective about superhero values. Um, with a social perspective, how um, could a modern character take place in modern social values? That's an interesting question because the de deconstruction is a postmodern concept. And as you can see, we're still in the height of postmodernism that there is a new proposal, something to overcome postmodernism, because one of the problems with postmodernism is that postmodernism is very nihilistic. And it's like, if everything values the same, everything goes well. And that's one of the, not to say that it doesn't have some positive values. I mean, all the all this stuff we have talked about, sex identity and all that stuff has to do with postmodernism. But now even, and now that in some of the comic books, you can see that question those uh, issues. Now people are talking about meta-modernism. Meta-modernism, just like postmodernism, acknowledges that the world sucks, that even if you work hard, you're not going to triumph at stuff, but takes the idea of modernism to say, but even if you don't make it, it's okay to strive for some ideal, to have some north in your life. Even if you don't make it, it's not the goal, it's the road, you know? And one good movie that uh, that shows meta modernism inside of comic books is the first Wonder Woman woman with because it has a lot of cynicism. It has humans are bastards. They go into war, but even if they still go to war, we have to strive for them not to go to war. Even if we don't make it, that's meta modernism. So yeah, th that's a big change in today's values. Postmodernism is getting stale. It's getting old. Uh, we don't want any more teachers that are cynics with, with orange mohawks. We want to have an ideal, something to fight for. And you can see it in today's society. You see, I'm, I'm already uh, relegated to a museum. So it has to do with that meta-modernism that it's a deconstruction of the deconstruction. Hmm? <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Angie? Yes, well, uh, I would like to add uh, that it is really interesting 
the vision of the gender and how the image and role of women have been modernized in the different eras of superheroes. So there was a time where uh, Wonder Woman was worried about, uh, you know, to protect the people, the citizens. And then uh, there is a, a time where Wonder Woman uh, worries were about getting get um, married, uh, how to dress. So I will I will really like to hear uh, maybe in another opportunity about this gender, the vision of, of the gender and this role of women in, in the superheroes and comics. No, that definitely, I think there's a lot to explore there, definitely. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. <laughs> whole uh, library of books i think that we could uh, explore that but no definitely it'll be uh, fascinating to have a look at that i'm sure we could uh, certainly certainly something we could discuss uh, at length <laughs> yeah. yeah but we're short of time but yeah well in one of my classes we discuss we discuss gender and comic books and what you say the different changes about femininity even before comic books you could see that the the roles of men and women are not set in stone. For me, one interesting case is during the 17th and 18th century, you could see that people were more androgynous. You see, with their wigs and their mascaras and their moles, and everybody used, uh, how do you call that in English? Um, ah, ruor. Um, so, yes. Like, blush. To, to, ah, blush. blush. Yes, for the rosy cheeks. <laughs> yes, even men use them. So, you see, it changed a lot. Most of the ideas that pervade were from the late 19th century. I don't remember what British king or lord or something said that men should be very, very sober in their dress. And that's why most men still today have, you see, in a marriage or stuff, wear grays or blacks, nothing very garish or very colorful, you see. But look at the, the, the dresses of men like King Louis the Thirteenth. Uh, it was very colorful. Yes, we would consider clownish and even gayish, if you like, today. So it's really, nice and as you said it, it would take another webinar to discuss all these images of gender and nowadays that we have all the discussions about the lgbtq new sexual identities and all the stuff that is really in the height of the agenda today well as you can see there are comic books that try to address they don't always do it right so there, there's also a criticism i mean female empowerment in a marvel movie oh they show all the marvel uh, superhero women oh one shot, there, there you go, there you go, there's your, there's your women. So that's something that we could also criticize and question. And, and, and at the same time, and there's always kind of, a, a, as we've seen uh, throughout the, the history of cinema as well, so often a confusion between representation and exploitation, um, where it's quite difficult at times to really kind of divide and say kind of, well, this is kind of a much more exploitative uh, showing, for example, of a LGBTQ um, character, uh, whereas this is much more of a healthy uh, representation because so much of it is kind of these very kind of thin dividing lines. But of course, you know, we, within comics, I mean, there's something that is uh, very much as an industry that uh, uh, exists, well, not only to represent culture, but to primarily to sell, then uh, we can see that, uh, that, that there's a lot of different things going on, a lot of things that uh, can be explored, definitely. <laughs> um, Camila? Yeah, I have a short one. Is if we can call the, this deconstruction of the deconstruction a reconstruction, is that okay? Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, 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 so I, well, Camila is one of my students, so <laughs> yes, because one of the things that I, that, that, that I usually explain classes that 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 Alan Moore even acknowledged that he failed with the deconstruction of the superhero is that alongside with a deconstruction, there must be a reconstruction. You can't leave people without anything to grab on. So he killed the superhero, more or less. I, I do insist that it was martial law, but okay, yes. But now you need to give people something to believe in. But I mean. In these postmodern times that are very cynical, that people are like, eh, there you go. But you can see that change in attitude, that metamodernism is trying to do the reconstruction that the postmodernism promised but didn't fulfill, you see? So yes, you could say that a deconstruction of a deconstruction in a certain way is a reconstruction, or it could be a new way of looking at things. It's not that uh, black and white, left, right, yes, uh, up and down, uh, that dichotomic view, Camila. Sometimes it could be even worse, but it could be to take to a new perspective that 
as I said, is what we're looking today uh, are those people that strive, whether they know or, or not, to towards um, uh, meta modernism. Hmm? Sure. Well, we've been kind of go going on, you know, for this this many years uh, now, kind of in terms of kind of uh, studying uh, how media works and how cultural representation works and how these different things that uh, you know uh, we've come come along so far from kind of where where Levi Strauss kind of first started kind of you know looking at these things in these particular kind of structural uh, forms that uh, we're now kind of in this way of yeah reconstructing what has been deconstructed and then reconstructing it back together again but uh, it's uh, certainly fascinating to see how it uh, how it all works and uh, and what sense we can make from it yeah um, well, um, I'd like to say once again, uh, thank you so much to Alejandro for being with us today. Uh, thank you for everyone that uh, been mm -hmm. here uh, watching today here uh, in the, uh, the Zoom and also uh, watching via uh, uh, Facebook as well. I'll be uh, sending the link out, by the way. Uh, we'll put this up on our YouTube channel. I'll send the link out later on if you'd like to have a look at this uh, another time. Um, I will just mention again um, my uh, elective from Geek to Chic, exploring games, uh, comics, games and geek culture will be happening uh, next semester. So if you're interested in practicing your English, uh, doing this in a way that uh, uh, we'll be looking at various uh, different factors and uh, very much flexible uh, in terms of your own interests, and then please do join us for that. Uh, also, uh, for the uh, from the English area, we also have coming up at the end of this month, our Halloween escape room uh, activity. Uh, so uh, if you're not afraid of being trapped in the uh, vaults of horror uh, for eternity, <laughs> then uh, please uh, join us for this uh, event. I'll put here the link in the chat if you'd like to sign up for this. Uh, this is going to be a really fun event. Uh, again, practice your English in a fun way and uh do some uh, some nice puzzles so well thank you everyone very much wonderful to see you uh been a really uh fascinating debate and uh hope we can uh, see you soon yeah thank, thank you everybody. goodbye bye thank you take care